Hey, welcome to another episode of the Innovation Mindset Podcast, powered by the Jim Moran College of the of Entrepreneurship. I am Mark McNeese, your host, and in studio today we have the CEO Sam Varn of Awards for You. Hey, Sam, thanks for coming in. Hey, Mark, it's how, always a pleasure. Thank you. How you doing? Doing great. Doing good so far. Everything's been good. Just got out of our busiest time of the year and survived it. So nice. It's really good. Nice. Outstanding. I really appreciate you coming in and, and giving the time to uh, sit down with us and talk about your business experience and then also talk about your connection with the Jim Moran Institute. And you told me a couple of fun stories about <laughs> being able to actually uh, spend time with Jim Moran. So we'll definitely mm -hmm. dig into that and hear all about that. Before we talk about JMI and, and Jim Moran, tell us a little bit about your business background and your upbringing and how did you get to to be the CEO of Awards for You. My father was an entrepreneur. He had a gas station, restaurant, liquor store, the whole nine yards growing up. Maybe it's in my blood. But when I was 18, I started my first business. I was a professional race promoter. I used to ride and race motocross back in the day. Nice. And a friend of mine was a professional, and we got together, wanted to create a practice track, ended up turning it into a regular racetrack. To, to have races. Where was this? This was outside of Brooksville, Florida, which is in central Florida, just north of Tampa. Okay. And we ha created this racetrack in 1974 and had my first race on January 20th, 1974, which some days, some dates just stick in your mind. And that was... A, and why did it stick in your mind? What's well, up so with that It was that the day? first event that we'd ever done as a race, I had ever done as a race promoter. I was 19 at the time and it was successful. It was like, whoa, this is pretty cool. I made money today. Nice. And that was a really good feeling. So it was a lot of fun, a lot of work. I was a terrible race promoter because I was I had a pocket full of money one day and I was broke the next mm. because race promoting is very subjective to weather and mm. crowds and this type of thing. But our highlight was in 1976 or 1975, we had the Winter Nationals, which brought in all the high-powered factory teams and everything okay. else. So it was a really big deal in that world. Sold the racetrack in March of 1976. And I was buying my trophies from a company in Tampa called Brown's Trophies. And the owner there called me one day and said, hey, do you need trophies? I said, nope, I sold my racetrack. He said, oh, we need a job. <laughs> I went, let's see. I'm now 20 years old. I have a pocket full of money because I just sold my racetrack. Right. I have a motorcycle and I have a good-looking girlfriend. What else do I need? I guess I should get a job. And I had gone to school at the University of South Florida to study engineering, but racing and promoting was much more fun. So... If I could change one thing without changing my whole life, I'd probably go back and graduate from college because that's one thing that I did not do okay. that I wish I had done. So buying trophies from Browns and going down there and working for them, I worked for them for 11 years, uh, moved up the ladder there, designed a lot of their processes, helped them get better too, I think. And through the course of time, was promoted to a branch store. We had the number one store in the, in the chain. Okay. And from there, it was about ceilings. And I hit a ceiling and told my wife, I said, we could do this ourselves one day. In the meantime, in December of 86, fast forward 10 years, I had come to Tallahassee to visit my brother. Okay. Anytime I go out of town, I would look around at other shops and see what they were doing. And right. I told Nancy, my wife, I said, we could do this. We can be competitive in this market. So let's go back to Tampa and save our money and then come back when we have enough to, to open up. That was in December of 86. Well, February of 87, an a publication landed on my desk and it had an ad in it for a trophy shop in Tallahassee for sale. Oh, wow. So I figured it was preordained destiny, yeah. fate, whatever you want to call it. So I came up here and investigated. He wanted out. I was looking for a way in. So we negotiated a sale and April 15th, another one of those dates you tend to remember, of 1987, I signed the paperwork. That was a Saturday. Signed all the paperwork and went back to Tampa, gave my notice, moved my family up here, and we began what was then known as Tallahassee Engraving and Awards. Okay. The company had two employees, mm -hmm. had $100,000 in sales. And in Tampa, I had a basic salary, and it was my real income was fueled by commissions. Okay. So to make money as a commission salesperson, you got to go out and sell. When I came to Tallahassee, I discovered there were six other companies in town that were my main competitors. And I realized I that most of them were comfortable to the point that they would unlock the door, turn on the lights, and wait on the phone to ring. Mm -hmm. That's all they had to worry about. 
Right. I didn't. I couldn't survive that way, having just invested all this money in the, buying this company. And my natural operative mode of operation was to go out and sell. Consequently, I hit the road. I hit the streets. Started. I joined the chamber of commerce. Got to know people because I knew no one in town except for my brother. Okay. And just started pounding the pavement and went out selling. And what I learned is that service has great value. And you go to people and you ask for their business. And nobody else is doing it. They're going to give it to you. It was pretty simple, frankly, taking candy from a baby, not to sound you know, presumptuous on my skill set or anything, but it was not hard. So we grew quickly. And my main method of growth was acquisition. Okay. So we bought one competitor in 1989. A couple others went out of business. In 19, and go back for a second, I talked to a business consultant in around 89 or so, and he said, write down your goals. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was in business. It was living day to day. Right. So he said, write down three goals for me. So I said, okay. So I wrote down, I want a million dollars in sales. I want to build my own building. And I want to buy out my biggest competitor. 1991, we built our own. In 1991, we built our own building. Okay. 1992, we hit a million dollars in sales. Nice. In 1997, we bought out our biggest competitor. And it's ironic because I've always heard, write down your goals and that makes them happen. Mm -hmm. Because you have something to go back to and look at what you're thinking about. And it, it worked for me. So I think from this point on, I've told all my, any business associates, are you writing down your goals? And so it made a difference for me anyway. And so the company grew and um, I got immersed in the industry. I became, I got on the board of directors for the National Trade Association. I became president. I have taught probably over a hundred seminars in our industry about our industry. Okay. Business, technical, runs the gamut. And so I built quite a nice reputation in the industry and built a good life for my family. Tallahassee has been a great town. It's been great for us. And uh, today we are at about 5 million in sales and about 37 people. We are looked at as a leader in the industry and just, and all this goes back to one thing I don't want any entrepreneur ever to lose sight of. And it's largely about your people. You can have the idea, you can plant the seed, you can promote the growth. Mm -hmm. but if you don't have the right people in place, doing the right jobs, you're going to just spin your wheels or put out way too much of your own energy to make things happen. So we have the, we have the best staff we've ever had in 37 years and they help it. They make it go. So it's been a really good ride. Can I ask you a question just about recognition and the importance of recognition? Right. You said you have, or I saw that you have a new title, <laughs> the guru. No, no I no? am. I am the Zen master of recognition, of recognition. because I am one with recognition. <laughs> I love and, it. Uh, no, it's true in that in the beginning, I was selling shiny objects, just something to sell. How am I got to sell this stuff to make a living? Right. But as I started learning more about the, the business side of recognition and what it really means to people, and if you stop and think about it, I, in my office, I have my very first trophy that I won in Little League Baseball. Okay. And I still have it. And I think a lot of people out there still have their the awards they won for the first time or an important award that means something to them. Recognition is about verifying people's accomplishments. It's making them feel we provide our purpose statement is that we provide the products that make people feel good about their accomplishments. And if you stop and think about it, Recognition is a very valuable tool to help reinforce a culture. It's good to reinforce promotion, performance, mm -hmm. safety, anything along those lines. It has to be given with real intent and not just passed out like water. It needs to have purpose and it needs to have meaning. But if it, once it has meaning and you establish a program of recognition, it will help in retention of employees. It will help in promoting safety. It will help in promoting sales. All the positive things that you want in a business to help your business grow, recognition is truly a very important part to, to be considered as part of your plan. No, I 100% agree. And I, in my home office, I have several recognition awards that actually I'm, I know that your company made several. But they have of our them. name on the back. Yeah, of them. They, yeah, your name's <laughs> on the back of them. And those are important to me. And a lot of times I wonder, okay, why is this important to me? And I think it's more what, what you said. It's a recognition of other people that you've done an excellent job or yeah. you've done something that's stand out. Do you know, not to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot. Sure. Do you know 
what the re- is there any studies out there is like the return on investment or anything like there, that i'm sure there are i do not know i'm not gonna i wish i could make up number or give you numbers that were valid but i just be making things up it's it is if you read any kind of business publications that mentioned all the time and they talk about giving money and money is nice mm-hmm. money is gone and when you give and it's not to say that you can't give recognition and money you can mm-hmm. do both if you want to or if you have the budget for it but money could be spent paying an electric bill. Right. It could be spent paying off paying a car payment. Things that have value but are not intrinsic in their meaning in that it's going to stick with people. It's just another payment they made, just another bill they paid. Recognition lasts. And I, we like to say recognition uh, lasts a lifetime. When you create a moment of recognition that lasts a lifetime when you make a presentation to someone. And this goes to the importance of our business, of the nature of our thought process in our business, If you have an awards program tonight, the awards are no good tomorrow. They need to be there tonight, be ready, have Mm -hmm. names spelled correctly, be on time, in in budget, so that when the time comes, people feel special. And it's really all about emotions. It's making people feel special. The best times that we have that we enjoy are when someone picks up an award or picks up an order or we deliver it or they present it, and we've seen all of these things happen, and there's tears. Yeah, People really are touched by recognition. We have a sign going down the stairwell in our building at like Notre Dame be a champion today, but ours mm-hmm. says, today you will touch someone's life. Mm-hmm. Make their moment of recognition special. And we really believe that. That's why I, <clears throat> I put out the title of Zen Master of Recognition because I, I really believe in it and I am I am one with recognition. No, I, I love it. Just to make your point on the on the bonuses, I've gotten bonuses in in my career, and that's nice, right? We all like that, but that that's gone. If you pushed me, say I'm on, what did you spend that money on? I'd probably say maybe I took my family on a vacation, which is very important. And, sure. Yeah. But I don't have that bonus sitting in my home office. I have those recognition trophies, or right. one thing that. The Jim Rand College does is when we're in a newspaper or a magazine, they put it up on the staff board, and that's a form of recognition yes, too, is. right? Mm-hmm. It's hey, look, you know what your colleague did, and that's super special as well. So I think that that your business, your value proposition, really is recognition mm-hmm. and in a tangible way, right? Yeah, and what I tell people is similar to what you just said. It's not. We want to sell everything to everybody, of course, like anybody else. But recognition doesn't have to be a shiny plaque. It doesn't have to be Mm -hmm. a shiny piece of glass or crystal or whatever. It can be a pat on the back and a handshake in front of a crowd to let people know that you've appreciated the efforts of that person, whatever it may be, sales, retirement, anything along those lines. Putting them in the spotlight is the important part. We like to add the tangible memento, as you said, because that's what they will look at when they get up in the morning after they've retired or get up in the morning to be driven to make that next big sale. It's a it's an affirmation that they have done it or could do it and could do it again. Yeah, <coughs> absolutely. Me, and pardon me. I also think that recognition, and you already, may already mention this, but I'm going to restate it and claim it as my own. <laughs> uh, I think there's also, at least for me, when I see other people recognized, it's an inspiration to me personally. Oh, that's the mark. That's where I need to get to be recognized. Again, not because I necessarily need that, but it's a tangible, okay, you know what? This is a level of performance that I should be at to bring you know, value to what I'm doing or others I'm working with. It can give you a mark to shoot for. Right. <clears throat> whether it's a competitive mark, whether it's a personal mark, mm-hmm. uh, it can give you a target. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. So all industries have challenges and everything. As we were talking earlier, I'm the founder of Red Eye Coffee. Right. And that industry has its particular challenges and things that we had to overcome. What were some, and maybe it's not in your industry, but just as an entrepreneur, what were some of the challenges that, that you've come across and that kept you up at night and that you eventually overcame? It's always about money mm-hmm. in one form or fashion, whether it's <clears throat> we had a number of supply chain issues after COVID, mm-hmm. just like everyone else did. Yeah. We have had staffing issues like any other business will. As you grow, when you start out small, we had two people. We were tried to be very much like a family. As you start growing, when you and it's been my experience, when you get to eight or nine, 
maybe 10 people, you start to realize that you need structure. It can't be right. just a bunch of people getting together, having a good time while they're working. Mm-hmm. There needs to be structure now. So may, now maybe you need to have management come in or you need management structures come in or different tiers of, of organization. That's been a, a challenge also to find the right people to put in those seats. But money is always a big challenge for their sales. We've been very fortunate in that nobody needs what we sell mm-hmm. to have food on the table or whatever. Right. Um, so we've always been fortunate. We're very much a luxury item from the standpoint of necessity. But our worst year was in the recession of 2008. Sales dropped overnight 20%. Scared the living tar out of me because there was no immediate explanation for it. It was literally January was one number. February was 20% below the year before. And it's, okay, what's happened? This is an anomaly. Then March was 22% down. And February, April was down. Again, April's our single busiest, busiest month when your busy months are down 20, 25%. There's a whole lot going on. And I'm very proud to say that while we had issues with that, we never laid anybody off. We reduced our, our people have always been the number one priority for me. We reduced hours, we reduced benefits, but we didn't lose it. Nobody lost their job. If someone left us through attrition, we did not replace them necessarily, but we spread those hours out, tried to bolster everything. The money act, the, the, jug, the juggling act of money is always a challenge. Every entrepreneur will tell you that. It's really been a matter, especially small businesses like ours that are doing at that time a million dollars, a million and a half dollars in sales, which sounds like a lot. Mm-hmm. And it's a goal that everybody wants to attain. But once you get there, now you need two million and then you need five million and so forth. And so it becomes relative. But the financial challenges are always there. I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of good people. I went through an embezzlement situation where I had an account, a, a bookkeeper that stole a, over $185,000 from us because she changed some internal checks and balances that I didn't catch, didn't realize she had changed them. And it was a cash skim. And in those days, we did a lot more cash. But right. Anyway, long story short, we money has been our single biggest challenge. Now, today, we're fortunate. We're very solid. We've got reserves. Things are good. That's fantastic. So let me shift gears a little bit and let's talk about resources that have been important to you over the year. That can be books or mentors or organizations like the Jim Moran Institute. Tell us a little bit about how you've had continuing education as the, oh, what's the title again? Zen Master. Zen Master of Of recognition. Recognition. That's right. I think community is the biggest word I could use for that. And that goes, there's a lot of different things to that. As I mentioned, when I came up here, I joined the Tallahassee Chamber, Mm -hmm. not knowing anybody, but I dove into the community. I tried to get involved so people would know who I am, uh, what I sold, how could I help them and so forth. And frankly, to make friends because I didn't know anybody. (laughs) And so the community of your community, the business community is, is one thing. Um, Your trade, in our trade association, as I said, I got deeply immersed in our trade association. That community was a a huge source of education for me because I got to know people around the country that did the same thing I did. A little bit different, a little bit better, a little bit worse. There was a lot to be learned. There was a lot to be shared. I taught over 100 seminars and and educational sessions in the industry. Mm -hmm. And every time I would teach one, I would learn something from somebody in the audience. It didn't matter what I was talking about. I would always learn something. The friends that I could call across the country say, hey, I've got this issue or where can I find this widget and so forth would always be were always a great source. And then locally, as I got more involved in Tallahassee, that's when I found the Jim Moran Institute. The peer-to-peer program is what I became involved with. Dr. Jerry Oster Young was the original founder, I believe, of those programs. And that's how I got to know. I got to know him through Rotary. I became a Rotarian and got to know him through Rotary and then learned about his JMI program, okay. got involved with the peer-to-peer group. We met once a month, <clears throat> sharing our trials and tribulations, our successes and our failures, mm-hmm. our challenges, and so forth, and making friends. And so having friends in the business community that you could honestly talk to right. openly with no fear of ridicule or anything else was really a big deal. Because then you could say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. I go, oh, no, don't do that. I tried that. It didn't you know, work. Or where can I find this source of funding or something to that effect? Sure. And so it was 
that's been the the secrets to the success of those three communities. So let's talk a little bit about your connection with the Jim Moran Institute. While we were talking before the podcast, you said you were in class one of the small <laughs> business executive program. That's correct. So yep. tell tell us a little bit about your experience with that. I'm sure it's grown and expanded since then. But I think they're on class 21 now or thereabouts. I'm not I, sure. I know they're in their 20s. I was just interviewing Jay Revel of Revel Media, and he just went through it and he said 20 something yeah. we were talking about memory getting older like <laughs> that was a class one okay that's a good that's, so that's easy that's to remember easy, right? easy number to remember yeah yes. absolutely so tell us a little bit about about your experience with that the criteria at the time and i don't know it today but the criteria at the time was you had to be in business with at least a million dollars in sales mm-hmm. so that they could you could have like-minded business people that could relate right. on the same general level now there was companies in there that were much bigger and it was just a really good experience we had we met monthly, I think it was monthly. And we had speakers, mm-hmm. some of which are more not- notorious in the community these days. Than okay. the world in those days, uh, let's just say they maybe take a wrong path once in a while. I gotcha. But anyway, it was still a very good program. Mike Campbell ran it in those days. Okay. And he did a really good job keeping us on track. He was always very diligent about keeping us on track. And that was a really good thing. But we did, again, we just got to share and listen to other experiences. In some cases, bigger better businesses that Mm -hmm. were just exponentially larger than ours, than mine. And those perspectives are always good. I went through a program that, not Jim Moran, and I don't want to drift off of that, but got me to be able to rub elbows with people at Disney and Walgreens and Publix. And that was a very eye-opening. They turned out to be jealous of me because I was an entrepreneur and could make all the decisions. All they had was a budget in front of them. And I learned that's something that you have to recognize is that a lot of the bigger businesses are a little more constrained in in what they are able to do because of they have more resources, but they have more layers of management that make decisions and things of this nature that can be challenging. But the JMI program, the small business executive program, it was just, don't remember specific programs, but it was always something very helpful. Finance, we had, we had HR discussions, right? things of that nature. They brought in uh, an HR attorney to talk to us about the nuances of employment that you don't think about. I had a situation today at the office before I left that we have to address. It's an HR-related issue. It's, okay. It hasn't happened to me in 37 years, so it's a challenge. Yeah. That, there's constant challenges with that, and it's definitely good to have people in your community that you can connect with. Are you still active with the peer-to-peer Yes, I am I? Yes, I have been active with peer-to-peer since, as far as I know, since it began. We were in, in, the, in group one, as okay. I, if I recall, with Jerry's, we called ourselves Jerry's Kids in those days. <laughs> and we had just a lot of good times and a lot of good memories and sharing. But I still, I've, I have been in the program for 20 some odd plus years. Right. Marina Lixon is currently our moderator today. Yeah, she's great. She is, I've known her, I knew her in business pro, in a previous life, so to speak. Okay. When she had her vitamin and supplement business, she okay. had that. And I got to know her back in the 2010 range. But anyway, so she runs that and we got a great group. We got about 10 or 12 business people in there okay. that are all just super people. And we get to share our stories about, again, employment issues, financial issues. We share tips and tricks about when the ERC was out, the employee retention credits were out. How do you file for that? How do you gain access to that money? What do you do about the different funding opportunities that are out there? And uh, watch out for this scam or watch out for that scam. So it's been very helpful in that regard. Just the sharing of information, sharing of knowledge, sharing of experiences has probably been the biggest thing. Are there multiple peer-to-peer groups or is it just one? I know that Marina has at least one other one. Okay. It's not as good as ours. No, of course not. <laughs> no, so, and, I, I, I don't know how many they have, frankly. Okay. But those are all basically, in those peer-to-peer, they're all non-competitive competitive yes. businesses, right? So Dude. you have a big mix. What I think you can say this. What type of other businesses oh, yeah, are sure, in your sure. cohort? There's, uh, the criteria is, again, I think it's a million dollars in sales minimum, but not a non-competitive situation. Right. You have to sign a non-disclosure so we can talk freely among ourselves. So we don't have to worry about somebody talking about my problem or Mm -hmm. his problem or her problem. But yes, we have, we have personnel companies. We have a consultant. We have an engineer, two engineers. One is since retired, but has remained in the group because we like him a lot. 
Okay. We have a, I want to say psychological services company. For la- I don't know the right way to say that. We have a salon. Okay. So we have a wide, diverse mix of people, all extremely sharp business people. We have a publisher, all kinds of different people, uh, all, all walks of life, all, walks, all types of backgrounds. And the ages are probably mid-30s to me. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm older. I'm probably the oldest one in the room, frankly. Okay. <laughs> but it's a good group, and it's a lot of people we can joke with, we can have fun with, we can talk to and ridicule when they're not there in, nice. in good spirit. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> so it's a lot of fun. No, I, I love that. Okay, I'm going to pull a question out of left field here okay. for you. Are you ready? Yeah. you ready for this? I would like to know what is the weirdest recognition <laughs> trophy or plaque that you have ever made? And it, it, it could be awards for you, or did you say it was Browns yeah. before mm-hmm. or Brown? One that you're just like, oh, wow, that that's well, interesting. I'll give you a little one, and then I'll give you the biggest one. The little one is that we have a, a product on Amazon that we sell. Mm-hmm. And what an award is given for runs the gamut. We have sold this one for like best sex ever. Okay. So somebody gave it to their significant other for having a good time. All right. So that was fun. That was, we laughed about that one. But the one that struck me the most, and it stands out to me, I was in Tampa working there, and this woman walked in with a pizza box. Mm -hmm. And she said, will you mount anything on a plaque? And I said, yes, if it's possible. And she opened this pizza box, and inside was this large cow patty. Okay. And anybody that doesn't know what cow patty is, look it up. (laughs) Pile uh, of dung. Pile of dung. And uh, it, it was dry, dried out. Wait, I got to pause you. I got to tell you, I got to ask you my joke or tell you my joke. Okay. This is my dad's joke. So <laughs> this is this is a double dad joke. Okay. So what's brown and sounds like a bell? I don't know. Dung. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, there's my dad, I get it. There's okay. my dad joke. Okay, I'm with your story. Yeah, keep, keep your day job. Um, <laughs> Okay, so anyway, so she opens this box, and this pizza box it's got this big cow patty in it. She says, I want this painted gold, and I want it mounted on a plaque. I'm, I'm quitting next week, and I want to give it to my boss for being the biggest pile of crap okay, ever. Okay, gotcha. And so we did. We spray-painted it gold, and we mounted it on the plaque. Nobody wanted to handle it, frankly. No. So they put on rubber gloves, and they, they mounted it on this big plaque, engraved to the biggest pile of crap ever on the bottom of it that – a crap was the kind word. Yeah, know? yeah. And she was thrilled and walked out, and I never knew what happened. So oh, wow. that was the oddest one. We've had some others that are uh, more X-rated that I won't get into. Okay. But it's been fun because you never know. And then you get the ones that bring the tears, and those are the ones that are really fun, the rewarding ones. Okay. You know, so. Right on. We do a program in the schools, and I, I don't want to go down too much of a path here, called the Medallion Program, where we recognize kids mm-hmm. that would not normally be recognized. Okay. And... It's a free program that we sponsor. We do it in all the six high schools here. And the fun part of that is watching the teachers, when they nominate the, the young man or young woman, and they come forward, and they start reading why they're there, and they, the teacher cries. And then mm-hmm. the parents are watching, and they cry. They cry. Now, the kids are too cool. They won't cry. Yes, big, big tears. I'm talking serious stuff. Yeah. And it's very rewarding because that's you're touching somebody's life yeah. right there. No, it's powerful. Yeah, it is. I think when you're a small business owner and an entrepreneur, when you bring that level of value into somebody's life, it changes something. Uh, There's one instance for me that I got a call from one of my baristas and they said, hey, there's a couple here and they're getting married and they want red eye at the wedding. We didn't do, at that time, didn't do a lot of catering and everything. Oh, let me talk to them and we don't do it but let me see if we can help them and and <coughs> stuff like that and we were talking and i'm like that's an odd thing to have at your wedding coffee sure. right you're like why would you want us to do it and they're like we had our first date at red eye oh that's cool. and red eye became like the place where our love grew and we really want this it, it's been such a big part of our relationship we sure. want it at our wedding and I was so touched by that because I'm like, wow, something that I thought about red eye as a concept and everything has actually become so important in these two people's lives that they want my brand Mm -hmm. at their wedding and on their most special day ever. And I just, 
that really elevated to me, like what we were doing in the community. And I just thought that was like such a cool. cool it is. Story. That's, a, that's sweet, one of your moments of recognition, even right. though there was no shiny award involved. I got no you, plaque. You got all the emotion out of that I did. because how it made you feel. And yeah. that's what it's all about. No, it was absolutely in- incredible. Do you have any stories mm-hmm. uh, that were really meaningful um, for you and in, in your journey as a entrepreneur and business owner? We were very fortunate around the 2004, five, six, seven range, we had a, we went on a big streak of winning awards. And I tell people that's funny in a, tell- in a small, smaller town like Tallahassee, we're one of the primary go-tos for awards and recognition products. And we deal with a lot of customers that are in, they give awards. And so when we were nominated and we won, number one, we always spell our name right. Yeah. But number two, it's always an honor because in our, my staff is under the instructions that if we ever get nominated and our name shows up on a list, I don't want to know. Because to me, it's very important to be at that ceremony or whatever be, have, hear your name called out as a nominee. And now a lot of people don't win because there's only, only going to be the one quote unquote winner. But if you stop and think, if you're nominated for something, that in itself is a big deal. No, it's a huge and deal. And people should be honored and feel good about that type of thing. So we've been nominated and recognized a number of different times for our involvement in the community, for business excellence and different things like that. So those have always been very special to me. My mother passed away in 1994. And when we were cleaning out her house, she had a thing, a little printout taped to her mirror in her bedroom. And it said something that I've always resonated with me is success is measured by more than just dollars. And that's always been important to me because You can be successful without being a billionaire. You can be successful in life without owning your own business. You can be successful in life in any number of gamuts and channels and directions. And it's not always about money. It's always about just having a a good, successful life. I'm not answering your question, and I'm trying to think of a good story that might be fun. But it's just it leads me down these different paths when I start thinking about things that mean something to me. We've had a number of different things in the company where we've we, rec- we recognize our own people and we call it putting them on the spot because what do you give to a company employee that makes awards for a living, right? So we put them, we have a thing we call on the spot. At our staff meetings, we have a big red spot and we call people out for doing something extra special or good or something as simple as helping somebody else finish a job up or something. Mm-hmm. And it's about recognizing people. And to me, it's just, a, that's really what is made me feel good about my own company and is that I know how we treat people. I know how we want to treat people. I know how we really, we want them. I tell people, I want you to be here until you get old and gray like me. But if you're not and you have to leave, I want it be to be for the right reason. Yeah. Not because you hated it here. That's what we try to do. Still not an answer to your question. No, it's good. I put you on the spot and (laughs) and I was just wondering exactly. At the end of each episode of the podcast, I love to talk or ask the business owner one question. So I'm going to ask you this question. So you came to Tallahassee uh, 37 years ago and you uh, bought and then rebranded to awards for you. If you could tell a 37-year-old, younger Sam Varn one thing before you started the Awards for You journey, what would you tell that Sam? It'll be worth it. Okay. Be patient. Do the right things. Make the best decisions you can, but it'll be worth it. Love it. Sam, I really appreciate you coming in and taking the time. Thanks for having me, Mark. I appreciate the chance to share the JMI new uh, word because it's a good program. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Innovation Mindset podcast powered by the Jim Rand College of Entrepreneurship. Hey, if you like this episode, please give it a like and uh, hey, Leave some comments. We read those. We respond to those. We love to get those. And then be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never hit or miss another amazing episode. We will see you next time.